put off by how long this video is, don't worry. I tend to jam-pack my videos with as much content, as many details as I possibly can, and I try to talk pretty fast. So while the video is a bit on the long side, I don't repeat myself, and I get into a lot of details about the subject that, you know, pretty much anything that I feel I can comment on and that I think you might find interesting. But hey, if the video is just too long for you to watch, chances are I recorded a shorter version, and the link will be in the description box. It's not an inferior video, it's merely a Cliff's Notes version of this very video. Daredevil Movie Review. Matt Murdock is a perfectly normal kid. He has bullies out after him, the kind of stock movie bullies that don't mind beating up a blind kid. Yeah. He has a slightly strained relationship with his father. His father being a bit of a washed up boxer and both of them kind of wish that it was like it was when he was in the, in the big leagues, you know. And so one day he starts really fighting for it, the father that is, played by, I think it's David Keith, not Keith David, but both are pretty cool and I sometimes mix them up, you know. One of them's white, the other's black. This one is the white one, which makes a lot more sense because otherwise you'd really wonder about Matt's complexion. I'm getting off topic. And he gets back into, you know, proper boxing. And then one day his former crime lord boss wants him to throw a fight. But for the sake of Matt, he doesn't. In retrospect, that was probably kind of a stupid time to make a stand. He ends up dead, and Matt now has a bit of a complex. He loses his eyesight, also at age 12 or so, because of radioactive waste right to the face. Somehow I think he'd go away with more than just, you know, loss of eyesight, but who am I to question? And once he grows up, he becomes a lawyer, fighting for those who can't defend themselves, and stalking criminals in the night as Daredevil. And in this adult state, he meets Electra Nachos, played by the delicious Jennifer Garner, who basically has two states when, when acting. The kick-ass, basically Sidney Bristow, and the, the sweet and charming, basically natural Jennifer Garner. And in this she draws upon both some. It's, it's more or less even, which obviously isn't quite how Electra is in the comics, but this takes some liberties. And it does actually get a lot of details about Daredevil right, but I'm still on the plot. And yes, they, they develop a romance, and they have a really good, nice, playful chemistry, very, very natural, which, you know, yeah, obviously, you know, together in real life and all that, but, you know, there are some real-life couples who don't have a lot of on-screen chemistry. And, as is per usual for both Matt and Elektra, tragedy may just be around the corner. To be perfectly honest, this is not the best superhero movie out there, and although I like it quite a bit, I will try to be completely honest about it. The, th this came 
pretty soon after the Spider-Man movie, the Sam Raimi Spider-Man movie, which really reinvigorated, you know, I mean, before that we had Blade, which certainly also did its part. Then came X-Men, which is a more... It, it holds back a little bit on... It, it doesn't go full, this is comic book movie, you know, that didn't really happen until X-Men The Last Stand, and that's when we wanted it to stop being quite so much of a comic book movie. This is not as much of a comic book movie as Spider-Man. It doesn't quite go for the, you know, the, the bright colors and that kind of aesthetic which Raimi nailed in the Spider-Man trilogy. I don't like his Spider-Man trilogy, but I cannot claim that he did not get that perfectly right. This tries to be a bit more mature and dark and a realistic approach to, you know, kind of comic book heroes. And it does also go the X-Men route a little bit of, you know, basically, Bullseye and Elektra kind of just wear leather. Yeah, that's, that's about it. You know, they, they look like, you know, a, a biker chick and a, you know, rock musician or something, so, yeah. With that said, the actual Daredevil outfit looks quite close to the comic, although they did darken the red a bit, which I think was a wise decision, especially with the overall tone of the movie. But yeah, this definitely is a more, you know, more dark approach with, you know, for one thing, where Spider-Man, the, the movies, especially the, well, yeah, the, the Spider-Man movies, there is a bit of a tendency to this otherworldly, you know, big quality, especially the Sam Raimi trilogy. And this just feels like, you know, in this, Daredevil is a human being. He, man, you know, he has superpowers, I meant to say that. He has this, you know, he, he lost his eyesight, but his other senses function with superhuman sharpness, and he gained this, in the movie they, they call it radar, I think, it, I think it's really sonar, basically, sounds bounce off, you know, surfaces, and he uses that, it's like, like a bat, you know, he uses that to get an idea of what stuff looks like, but that also gives him a very clear you know, kind of weakness, which again was something that Spider-Man, yeah, in that if, if there are very loud noises, it kind of just throws his sonar completely off, you know, and, and really, really harms him because of this superhuman hearing. But yes, you know, he has these superhuman abilities and he is really, really good at fighting, but he's a human being, and he's gonna take some blows sometimes. He doesn't always go... There's, there's a fairly early scene where after an action scene, he goes home, and he's like recuperating, he's taking a shower, and he, you know, he discovers that one of his tooth got... T teeth got knocked out, and, you know, he takes it out, and, and that's, that's his reality, you know, and, and that's just so far away from this really glossy kind of, you know, approach of the Spider-Man movies, and yeah, I, I really appreciate it, I thought that that was, and they get some of the, you know, there's far too much, Daredevil, I think it was sometime in the 60s that the comic got created, so, there's a lot of backstory, there's a lot to fit in. Obviously, they can't do justice to everything, but they actually managed to sneak in a lot of these little hints. I will admit, they're gonna confuse people who don't know the comics. They're gonna be like, what is that? What did, wh where did that come from and what does that even mean? But for those of us who have read it, you know, you've got the this sort of also strained relationship with his faith. You know, where he, you know, he, he, yeah, you know, that, and, you know, just, Karen is there, 
Foggy is there, although they change his character around a bit. I find this one much more charming character. He's played really well by John Favreau, and he's just so much fun. He he's basically the main comic relief of the movie, and he is just really really funny. He is still kind of awkward and just really he really badly wants big expense you know big rich clients, and it doesn't matter so much to him if they're guilty or not. You know, whereas Matt Murdock is kind of like you know the the paladin with you know oh we must you know fight for justice and I will only take a client if they are innocent you know which was probably kind of necessary because otherwise people would be like okay it's a superhero movie but it's a movie about a lawyer make up your mind he can't be both nice and a good person and a lawyer you know that just doesn't happen and that actually is if you like kind of lawyery stuff in American movies, the, the American justice system, there's a lot of fun stuff in this. You know, basically, Foggy and Matt, both of them lawyers, whenever they talk, they have this kind of lawyery, you know, like the, the jargon and that kind of touch to it, the, you know, with it's, it's almost like they're. You know, th there's one point, at least, where it's almost like one of them is questioning the other, as if the other is on the witness stand and something. It's just, it's a lot of fun. And they have great chemistry together. They, they just feel like those two have been buddies for decades. You know, those two, peas, you know, not, not peas in a pod, but just, they're close. You know, they may not see eye to eye on everything, but they, they respect each other and, you know, and in general, I think that's something that's really good in this, that's even better than Spider-Man, the relationships between the people. The relationship between young Matt Murdock and, you know, his father, whose name I can't remember for the life of me, is just really credible. You know, Matt really looks up to his father, Jack, and Jack kind of, you know, he, he wants to be a good father and he wants to be a good role model for his kid. But he also has these, you know, there's maybe some problems with the money and stuff, just, excuse me. And the, excuse me, the relationship, this, excuse me, the romance between Elektra and Matt is, it, it really works because they kind of both have this kind of tragic backstory. I'm not going to give Elektra's away because it's, it's revealed a bit into the movie. But they can relate to each other, and other than that, Matt is a really, really closed-off person, and that's also something. This is a. This is meant to be at least a complex lead character. Yeah, I'm not sure. I don't know, ben Affleck, he he does his best, and actually, I suppose where he really fails, and this is not gonna come as a big shock is in the action department. The guy is not an action star. It's really just that simple. He, he is not convincing as an action star. This paycheck, I don't know what they were thinking, you know. Yeah, then again, this and paycheck got made kind of close to each other. Did, did he have any other action roles? Maybe that's kind of... And the, the Jack Ryan movie, The Sum of All Fears. Yeah, I, I don't know what they were thinking. For at least a few years there, people looked at Ben Affleck and said, hey, he can do action, can't he? Why? I don't see why not. Let's try. And they tried. And we wish they hadn't. The, the dialogue is fairly witty and you know quite clever. And at this point, I realize I have yet to start comparing the versions. I would like to know, for anyone who hasn't already watched this movie, a lot of the complaints that people have are with the theatrical cut, and I completely understand. I don't completely agree, but I understand. The theatrical cut is not really a complete movie, and this is something really worth noting. It was not the director's fault. It was studio pressure. They wanted the movie short, they wanted the movie PG-13, and what happened? They cut out vital 
parts of the plot. There are plot holes in the theatrical cut. Most of those are gone in the director's cut. And there's some really awkward editing where they tried to, you know, cut it down into. And then there are uh, a couple of... I have a feeling that some people really dislike some of the casting in this. There are a lot of people who really don't like Jennifer Garner. And then there is the, the role of the kingpin. He is not black in the comics, and that's really not a secret. And I can imagine that a lot of people were, you know, I, I've heard of people who were really unhappy with that. Here's the thing, a white guy with that, of, of that size is going to be like a wrestler. Wrestlers are, in fact, not good actors. It, it yeah, I, I don't even really need to justify that. That just kind of, it, it, yeah, they're, they're kind of, they're used to overacting, and so when they get to, you know, I'm not saying that all of them are like without charisma, but I can't really think of any who are good actors. With that said, I don't claim that everyone who dislikes the movie, even those who, you know, if you've watched the director's cut and you still don't like the movie, it's, you know, that's fine, to each his own. And I'm not saying that the only complaints about the movie, either cut, is, you know, with the casting. I'm just saying, do note, some of the people who object to this movie do fall into those, you know, camps. And now that I've brought up Kingpin, he is really badass in this. He is seriously, he is so freaking intimidating. You know, Michael Clark Duncan, Michael Clark Duncan, you know, the guy, he's got the acting prowess and he is just freaking huge. You know, the guy is just so imposing and he has this real shark's grin in the movie. And they, you know, they, they do the thing with, you know, he does the pose, the, the, the kingpin pose, with complete with the, you know, w walking stick. Yeah, something like that. You know, and they put him in the nice fancy suit, you know, really, really cool looking. And Bullseye... <laughs> this was kind of the movie that sold me on Colin Farrell, actually. Before that, before this... I was kind of like, yeah, okay, ooh, big bad boy, and he's like, yeah, okay. He plays this manic, obsessive, psychotic, sadist hitman, you know. I mean, the bullseye of the comics is pretty out there, and this is a pretty, you know, it's, it's not exactly the same, but it's, He's as much fun as he is in the comics, I'd say. And he's just, he'd as soon kill you as look at you. He's, if, if, you know, if he feels like it, he's gonna kill you. And he's, you know, he, he has the, the power to hit anyone with, you know, just extreme accuracy. He, he, he'll hit exactly where he wants. And in his hands, literally, a pencil is a deadly weapon. And it's just, they have so much fun with that in, in, the, in the movie, you know. And he, he cranks up a pretty serious body count. It, it rivals that of some 80s slasher movies. Enough said. The... I've heard some complaints about the pacing. I'd again say that the director's cut does a better job. I can maybe kind of understand there is a lot of action in this movie. You know, and, and some would say too much. I kind of side with director Mark Steven Johnson. Every fight is different. You know, there's something, there's something to each fight. No, no two fights feel like just, you know, there's never just, oh, this is just repeat, or this is exactly what we've seen before. There are actually some, you know, nice little nods to it. If, you know, yeah, I'm, I, I can't talk too much about that without spoilers, but just, yeah, you know, notice the choreography. Quite a lot of the action is this really well choreographed, fast-paced martial arts. 
and that is part of where my preference for this over Spider-Man comes from as well, because I freaking love martial arts. And yeah, it just, you know, Daredevil kicks some pretty serious ass. And he's nicely backed up by a rock heavy soundtrack. You know, they've got Disturbed, I think, and you know, we've got two of Evanescence's best songs, which also kind of gives you an idea of the kind of dark emo mood of the film. I'd say the plot moves along quite nicely. This is again, especially in the director's cut, which adds this really neat mystery and you know, gives Foggy and Murdoch to a, a case to be working on, you know, throughout the, the film, and yeah, it, it just really adds to it. The humor is quite good, some, you know, nice quips and such. There are also some pretty bad one-liners and the like among them. The CGI tends to be rather good. There are a few really, really noticeable exceptions, though. And you know, a lot of people say that it technically is true. This movie does rip off some other better movies. And Spider-Man 2. There are, you know, the... So, some of the stuff was almost unavoidable because Spider-Man and Daredevil are fairly similar. I mean, they both swing through the city. They're both New York characters, you know, just Matt is, Daredevil is, you know, very central to this one neighborhood, you know. And, you know, what's it called? Hell's Kitchen, where Spider-Man is all of New York. But yeah, there are some, you know, Actually, one of them kind of brings up a, a kind of... They, they were slightly confused when, when making the movie about something. The movie rips off The Crow when apparently Daredevil spread out gasoline in order to, you know, do the, the double D, the, the logo, you know hoping that someone would light it. Otherwise, it's kind of a wasted effort. And why does he do this? Well, it's a signature. You know, it's, it's a trademark. It allows people to kind of realize that, yes, Daredevil did this. Even though he apparently really doesn't want to be found out because, you know, Matt gets kind of nervous when Foggy, this is early on, not a spoiler, when Foggy mentions that in the newspaper there's apparently a picture, he's all, you know, he's, he's, <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, I, I don't know quite what they were, it, it's like half the people making the movie figured that, you know, he'd want a trademark and he'd want to, you know, spread fear in the, you know, by, by sort of a reputation, the kind of Batman thing, and th there is a lot of Batman-esque stuff in this. You know, he, he really does use, you know, use the shadows, and yeah. I suppose that more or less covers it. But yeah, if... One thing to note about the theatrical cut versus the director's cut. If the director's cut is the first you watch of it, for some reason, Mark Stephen Johnson, I guess he just figured that everybody watched Daredevil in theaters. He took a couple of things out of the director's cut, including really, really useful explanatory lines, which, yeah, so it kind of does I don't know, I, I'm not sure I can completely recommend watching the theatrical cut, but maybe just after you watch the director's cut. Before you make up your mind about the film completely, just, you know, find, I don't know, probably IMDb has like a comparison or something, 
between the versions and just find out what was maybe cut from the theatrical cut, you know. And by the way, the director's cut adds 20 or 30 minutes of footage, bringing it to two hours, a little over two hours if you count the credits. And yeah, the other one is like an hour and 40 minutes, I think. Excuse me. Please rate and comment, and hey, if you like this video, that subscribe button's just waiting for you to click it.